Hello everyone, welcome to the daily editorial analysis of the Shankar AS Academy brought to you by the Salespedia team and this is Abhinaya Sampath for today's current affairs analysis for the date of 22nd October 2024. So in the first part of the video you would have seen three main articles in respect to the prelims importance. Now in this video we will be seeing other three articles which are important in the perspective of mains. So the topics for discussion are as follows. The title, uh, the article title, a terror attack, many signals from the Indian Express talks about the recent militant attack which has been happened in the Jammu and Kashmir in the Z-Morph tunnel. Next is the article title, Delhi Berlin reconnection of the Indian Express talks about the importance of Germany and Indian and the European country as a whole, their relationships with us and their strategic as well as their trade importance. And finally, the last article titled A Case for Nature Restoration Law in India from the Hindu talks about the possibility of the having a nature restoration law for a country like India. So without any much further delay, let's get into the article's discussion along with the mains practice question. So moving on to the first editorial article, a terror attack by the militants had happened in the region of Jammu and Kashmir in the Z-Morph tunnel. So this uh, z mob tunnel is one of the most important, strategically important tunnel when it comes to Ladakh. Here it is the connectivity point between the Srinagar and Leh. Along with the Zojila tunnel, it is also one of the important tunnel where it connects the town of Kangan to the tourist spot of Sonmark of Jammu and Kashmir. So this 6.5 uh, kilometer tunnel is a flagmanship in, uh, infrastructural project or tunnel project where along with the Zojila tunnel, it is an all weather connectivity tunnel. So recently due to the weather conditions, this tunnel has been closed and because of this can be one of the reason for the militants uh, activities to be happening. So along this Srinagar Leh Highway, which is the NH1, uh, NH3 of Manali and Leh Highway are the only two highways which connects Ladakh with the rest of the India. So this highway as well as the tunnels connected with it and Ladakh in general is strategically very important for India. So initially this project was conceived by the border road organization in 2012 and now it is overtaken by the national highways and intra development corporation. So after seeing this importance of this tunnel, we should also move on to see the uh, prevalence of the cross-border terrorism which has been present in the area of Jammu and Kashmir. So now moving to the historical background of terrorism when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir. After India's partition in 1947, Jammu and Kashmir ruler Maharaja Hari Singh have signed the instrument of accession to join India after facing an invasion by the tribal forces from the Pakistan. So here this has led to the first Indo-Pakistan war which has divided Kashmir between India and Pakistan as well. So in 1965, the Indo-Pakistan war between the two countries have created tensions where the Kashmiris have felt politically to be marginalized and they have become more disconnected from the mainstream place. Later in 1960s, there were uh, increase in the rise of militancy where it led to political instability and also it led to uh, rigid elections where the local feel discontent and it led to the rise of militants group. Here Pakistan have started actively to support militant groups like the uh, Hezbollah Mujahideen and uh, lashkar e taliban leading to an insurgency. So here also the Kashmir Pandit exodus that is the large migration of the Kash uh, Kashmir Pandits from Kashmir has led worsening the situation in the 1980s. So along with this in the 1990s Pakistan's support for the militants group in Jammu and Kashmir have been continued through proxy wars. Here notable attacks can be 1999 Kargil war, 2001 Indian parliament attack and very recently in 2016 Uri attack has been escalating tensions. So among after all of these tensions post 2019, it was a landmark judgment on bringing the article 370 where in August of 2019, the Indian government had revoked the article 370 which granted special status to the Jammu and Kashmir. So this has led again leading to increased tensions between India and Pakistan. Even though there were a lot of a rise in the local unrest, but there were a lot of control which was remained all through the 
large scale militancy. So, coming to the current scenario here, the militancy has been reduced significantly compared to earlier days and terror groups are still active with support from Pakistan, unfortunately. The region still remains uh, militarized with continued terror attacks and infiltration attempts. So, through many international platforms, organizations, meetings, committees and so on, India is one of the most primary reason when it comes to security is how to tackle the cross-border terrorism, especially for the area of Ladakh and especially with the borders of China also includingly. So, as I told before, when it comes to in challenges, cross-border terrorism is one of the most important reason and remains one of the most important challenge. So, as, as I told before, Lashkiri Taiba or Jaishi Mohammed uh, terror organizations operate from Pakistan occupied territories where they are receiving fund training and uh, infiltration and exchange of weapons and arms as well. So, this infiltration has been happening across the LOC that is the line of control which is continuing to happen even despite India's strong counter infiltration grid. Next is the most important thing which is the radicalization of the youth. So, radicalization through social media, through local grievances and uh, and other funding through foreign institutions and in, through the informal institutions and networking has been growing a lot of issue here. Many young people in the valley are vulnerable to the recruitment by the terror outfits that is the terror uh, groups due to factors like unemployment, not having a stable political system and sometimes perceived lack of economic opportunities. And even trust plays a very important reason when it comes for the radicalization of the youth as well. Next is local insurgency and internal support here. Section of population sympathize with the idea of separatism. So, this can result in local support for the militants, uh, thus making the counter-terrorism operations to be very difficult to handle. Actions like stone pelting, that is throwing of stones, incidents and civilian protest during anti-militancy operations create complications for the security forces. Next is the ultimate which is the human rights concern here. Allegations of human rights violations by the security forces in counter-terrorism operations lead to criticism. So, ultimately due to the politics of the political system for a country like India hurting or are ultimately impacting the civilians, very vulnerable and very innocent civilians at the end of the day. So, here the civil liberties are being questioned a lot and we as a country, the challenge we are facing is to bring a balance on the aggressive anti-terror missions, measures, especially under the lens of international agencies. And next is one of the most important challenges is the geographical location. Here, the difficult difficulty when it comes to the terrain of Jammu and Kashmir, particularly at the line of control and higher reaches. It makes very easy for the militants to infiltrate as sometimes or mostly it is the militants who know the local geographical scenario and are aware of the connectivity and they are networking with the local entities. So, it more than other people, it would be them knowing the geographical positioning of the area. And final is the development changes here. Underdevelopment and lack of infrastructure has been still a question in certain areas of Jammu and Kashmir, even though projects like Zojila uh, Tunnel or ZMOF Tunnel are addressing only one point or some point of the areas, but not totally of other areas of Jammu and Kashmir. Therefore, it communities or the local population from particular area are questioning the government. So, when it comes to addressing this issue, first is to strengthen the counter-terrorism operations. That is by prioritizing intelligence-based operations, logistic-based operations need to be prioritized. Here, technologies like the drones, surveillance technologies can be improved. There can be bringing in improved border fencing and so on. Next is to have an engaging local communities. Here again, trust is one of the most important thing when it comes for the local people. So, along with the awareness campaigns as well, they, the security forces must work to avoid human rights violations especially and involve the local stakeholders in bringing a peace building effort. So, there needs to be contribution by the local level stakeholders whenever there is a decision which involves high maintenance or next is to have an economic generation and economic development, involvement of these youth even for example in 
the projects infrastructure projects can help them to have a stable income here it also in, uh, includes increase of skill development uh, bringing in entrepreneurship opportunities and other infrastructure investment for example tourism tourism is one of the key economic driver and it should be revitalized with the improved security along with the interest of people are also carried next is reviving political engagement that is restoring the democratic process in jammu and kashmir by holding free and fair elections and ensuring political representation so recently the elections have been conducted in jammu and kashmir and just after a week or so this news is such an unfortunate incident so again there is this cycle like the cycle of poverty there is a cycle of mistrust and so on so in order to bring a stable government there needs to be focusing on the idea of democracy and finally is the re-radicalization and bringing in social reforms educational reforms that focus on modern secular and scientific education can counter such extremist ideas which are spread by radical groups and bringing in social and cultural integration and awareness programs can create a sense of national unity which has been an ultimate idea of india as a whole now moving on to the second editorial article here the article talks about the visitation of german chancellor to india where there is reconfirmation and reimportance of the relationship ties between india and europe especially with german and india so in light of this article let us see a uh, mains question and straight away we will move on to the articles discussion discuss the current challenges in indian germany relations focusing on economic ties technology transfer and geopolitical concerns so now having a look into the historical ties and diplomatic relations india is among the first countries to establish relation with the federal republic of germany after the second world war in 1951 also india is among the first countries to support the unification in the 1990s here germany is among one of the india's largest trading partners in europe and it is important strategic partner globally here india has established their strategic relations in 2000 so the two nations are engaged in a lot of bilateral meetings which includes high level visits to strengthen their cooperation through the areas of trade security and global governance in general so looking into the bilateral sorry looking into the economic trade relations germany is india's largest trading partner in europe as per the recent data it stands approximately of 24 billion dollars annually here the german companies are major investors when it comes to india for sectors like engineering auto automotive renewable energy chemical energy industries and so on which we would be seeing more forward here india is also becoming a favorable destination for german for small and medium sized enterprises germany also have shown a strong support for investments for initiatives like make in india thus there is greater encourage uh, encouraging of collaboration in manufacturing and industrial sectors moving on to the defense and security there has been a lot of collaboration when it comes to defense with the emphasis on cyber security counter terrorism maritime cooperation and so on so germany and india have signed defense cooperative agreement in the 2006 and the emphasis still continues to today's date also both the nations share uh, concerns regarding the regional security particularly in the indo pacific region so this second european country to issue guidelines is on the indo pacific region would be germany here along with technology transfers like uh, cyber security and artificial intelligence have been a recent progress when it comes to this relationship so looking into the science and technology and innovation the indo german science and technology cooperation agreement have been signed between india and germany in 1971 in itself here over 600 partnerships are existing between india and german institutions one of the key areas of collaboration would be as i told before renewable energy sustainable urban development and climate change also when it comes to education germany is the top destination for indian students here according to the data recent data almost 34000 students are in the education sector from the country india so the data on the 600 partnerships over 600 partnerships are provided by india german chamber of commerce and industry sector 
and also along with Ministry of the External Affairs. Moving on to the green and climate cooperation, Germany has a very vital role when it comes to India's green uh, transition. Here both the countries work closely for the issues of climate change, sustainability, energy and environmental protection. So in 2006, the Indo-German Energy Forum or Green Energy Corridors Project has been an uh, agreement being signed between India and Germany which focuses on the green energy. So this uh, green energy corridor will be an integration to the renewable energy into India's grid projects. Moving on to the cultural and educational exchanges, there has been a thriving of uh, enthusiasm when it comes to the promotion of art, music and literature between these two countries. So one of the famous, the Max Müller Bhavan, which has been established by Germany, promotes German language and culture in India. Here, Max Müller is the first Indo-German scholar, a European scholar, especially in languages who have translated Upanishads and Rig Vedas. Uh, looking into the Indo-German strategic partnership, India is a select group of countries with Germany to have the Indo-German in, uh, intergovernmental consultations. Here it is a unique platform for high level engagement of various issues among the various sectors including infrastructure, digitalization and so on. Here Germany has supported India's candidature for permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council along with the G4. So within the framework of G4, India and uh, Germany are working on the expansion of the United Nations Security Council that is the UNSC. So the G4 comprises of Brazil, Germany, India and Japan. So these four countries have permanent uh, seat when it comes to the UNSC. So looking into the challenges in the relations, there has been general challenges that is the trade imbalance as the India are having more imports from Germany than the exports. Next is to have a market access. Here uh, due to the regulatory barriers and stringent standards when it comes to German market, it can hinder the growth. Next is having a technology transfer. Here digital divide is one of the biggest issues for a country like India. So having a technology transfer agreements, it needs more uh, efficiency among the initiatives by the government, private as well as by the local people. Next is having an in, uh, investment flow hurdle due to this uh, trade balance, trade imbalances and technological transfers and ultimately leading to the geopolitical differences. Both India and Germany are uh, having different perspectives when it comes to geopolitical issues such as the relations with Russia and China and so on. Now looking into a way forward, first there needs to be strengthening of economic ties that is the upgradation of the trade agreements to address tariff and non-tariff issues, having a bilateral investment promotions and so on. Next is fostering of the technology transfers through having joint ventures in the renewable energy sector, technology sectors and so on. For example, under the Smart Cities Initiative, German has been in partnership with three cities that is the Bhubaneswar, Kochi and Coimbatore under the Sustainable Urban Public Transport Initiative. So it also encourages research collaborations and development collaborations and so on with German universities and other research institutions. Next is having a cultural exchange programs that is there is giving importance to people to people uh, initiatives, having scholarships, language trainings, cultural events, art festivals, exhibitions and so on and having academic conferences also. There is, so there is mutual appreciation of each other's heritage. Next is addressing a geopolitical concerns. So there needs to be regular dialogue in platforms like the UN, G20 and World Trade Organizations and also sustainability and climate change initiative would be the ultimate goal when it comes to any countries having their international relations. So joint climate projects and technology for sustainability cannot be a topic to avoid. Now moving on to the final editorial article for today. This interesting article talks about the adoption of a nature restoration law in India which is modeled after the European Union's regulation to combat land degradation and biodiversity loss. So this article highlights India's environmental challenges which includes uh, desertification, deforestation, emphasis on the need for having a legal binding restoration targets so that the law would not only restore the ecosystems but also enhance agricultural productivity, bring in jobs and contribute to the climate resilience. 
so in light of this article let us see a mains question and we would be moving forward with the framework of the question immediately discuss the need for comprehensive nature restoration law in india analyze the potential benefits challenges and key components such as such a law should include to ensure the sustainable ecosystem restoration so now let's move on to the discussion so what is nature restoration this law seeks to reverse the environmental degradation thus it focuses on restoring the ecosystems that has been damaged by human activities so the key goal is to first restore the biodiversity and to bring back the native species to promote ecological balance next is to combat the climate change such as restoring the ecosystems for example forests wetlands mangroves can help for the carbon sequestration and protect against the natural disasters like flood and cyclones and finally the goal is to have enhancing the ecosystem services so through the enhancement of the ecosystem we can provide to bring services like clean air water infiltration fertile soil which is ultimately a gift for the essential of the well being of human society so what are the key components of potential nature restoration law so when it comes to the restoration target it has been set legally binding targets to restore at least 20% of the land of sorry of degraded land by 2030 here there has been defined ecosystem specific goals for forest wetlands and urban spaces which is the urban green spaces and next is to have a annual progress reports from the states which is monitored by independent bodies like the national green tribunal next is to have a community involvement here involving the local community and indigenous knowledge is important for the restoration efforts there needs to be a effort to train the communities when it comes to reforestation and biodiversity conservation here it helps to promote ecotourism to generate income and at the same time there is preserving of the ecosystem so therefore the forest as well as the people are being benefited looking into the legal enforcement and penalties uh this restoration law tries to impose penalties for non compliance with restoration targets here there is strengthening the national green tribunal for effective enforcement next is restoration of the specific ecosystem so there is focus on afforestation and biodiversity restoration programs uh including the enhancement of the ramsar sites strengthen the river ecosystem like the namami ganga for example and mandate the urban green spaces for restoration to counter the urbanization impacts especially for cities and urban cities metro has been a very big issue when it comes to green space and finally is to have an integration with the national and global goals here the law tries to align with the national policies such as the national action plan on climate change and a uh, national biodiversity action plan also it also tries to work with the international commitments for the framework such as the paris agreements and sustainable development goals ultimately so now let us see why india needs a restoration law india being a diverse country with not only with its communities and people it is also a diverse country where it has all kinds of ecosystems and having a fast growing population it faces severe environmental challenges so having a nature restoration law in india can address multiple and critical issues like the land degradation and desertification so according to the isro desertification atlas of 2021 about 30% of india's land is degraded due to deforestation soil erosion and unsustainable practices here the uh, nature restoration law can mandate the restoration of the degraded lands and help india to achieve land degradation neutrality that is the ldn target which comes under the un convention to combat the desertification or uncc and next is to have a biodiversity conservation india as a mega diverse it uh, is a house for almost 7 to 8 percentage of world species yet it faces threats from habitat loss pollution climate change and infrastructural projects obviously so the law can uh, act as an enforcement to bring in restoration of the biodiversity rich areas which is eastern himalayas sundarbans and other wetlands to support the endangered species next is combating the climate change 
here restoring the carbon uh, carbon sinks is one of the important aim restoration efforts can help india in meeting the ndc that is the nationally determined contributions under the paris agreements so it also helps in the climate resilience ecosystems like the mangroves and coral reefs can enhance coastal protection along with a uh, high risk of sea level rising and extreme weather events cities under the seashore having the rise of sea levels is such a question for its existence in itself next is providing ecosystem services here due to this restoration process as i told before there are vital services which can be provided with even more quality and with even more quantity it can also help to provide soil purification soil fertility increase and also a, a natural flood control so this can ultimately lead to the increase of food security in a country and finally it's to have a sustainable livelihoods here due to this restoration law there is an impact on communities where many rural communities rely ultimately on the ecosystems for their livelihoods here this projects can create green jobs which is eco tourism afforestation supporting rural employment schemes like the manrega so thank you everyone for watching this video don't forget to give a like comment and a share and to further not to miss any other content subscribe to our channel thank you and have a nice day